Well, I'm uh, secretly augmented by AI, so you know none of it's <laughs> down to me. It's all down to the computers. Anyway, we you know AlphaGo is going on in Korea right now, but I understand that Microsoft has had a kind of AI hit on its hand in, in China. Can, can you tell us a bit about that project and what you're doing with it now? Sure. Um, well, first of all, on AlphaGo, it's just incredibly exciting and inspiring to see these kinds of inflection points in the field. And so, uh, so we're just watching with a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. Uh, so uh, what you're referring to is, uh, is kind of a strange thing. So I want you to bear with me a little bit in case it sounds a little bit odd. Um, there's a 17-year-old girl in China. Um, her name is Xiao Ice. Uh, or you know, Little Ice or Ice Junior. And she's very popular in social media, has about 40 million followers. Um, interestingly, she's so compelling, about 15 million of those followers are interacting with Xiao Ice about an average of 23 times a day, which is really incredible. And of course, Xiao Ice is able to do that because she's virtual. Uh, she's an AI chatbot. And this started off as a science experiment in Microsoft Research. Uh, we've, of course, been working uh, with our uh, product team partners on Cortana uh, for quite a while. And Cortana is an AI that really tries to understand the semantics and intent of what people want and need. Um, but there's another way to try to approach AI, which is just through sheer big data. And, uh, and so we launched that experiment in China, and she's really been a viral hit. So when do we, you know, when do we get a kind of chatbot on steroids in Cortana? You know, when's that arriving here? <laughs> well, um, so, you know, I've always wondered uh, how specific to China uh, this is. Um, by the way, you know, Xiao Ice is now doing the nightly weather report on National Dragon TV in China, which is just incredible. And so she engages in chit chat with the uh, news anchorman, which is uh, really crazy. We did just launch a Japanese market version of Xiao Ice called Rina, um, and uh, she's already attracted about 1.5% uh, of the Japanese population as followers. Um, so we are actively working on and exploring other markets, um, and so I guess the best I can say is stay tuned. Okay, and, and I guess this is part of a bigger transformation for Microsoft, where you're, you're famous to be the company that is good at inventing stuff, and then you have this tendency that sometimes it, it kind of stumbles on the way to products, or you have trouble getting it out to the real world and out to consumers. There's been a bigger story at Microsoft of the change to Microsoft Next, where you're changing how you do research. How does Xiao Ice and other projects fit into that? And yeah, so first of all, that question is incredibly annoying to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but uh, uh, it, it is true that, you know, <laughs> I know, it, it, it is actually this crazy thing where virtually every product uh, that Microsoft has has the imprint of Microsoft Research mm -hmm. Technologies in it. Um, but you're right, we've always been kind of behind the scenes, and uh, for the most part, traditionally, we uh, never went directly to consumers, directly to, to, to people. Um, we always went through Bing or Xbox or you know, Microsoft Word or, or whatever. Um, and so I think the biggest change now is um, with Satya Nadella, he is, he's really kind of pushed us and given us permission to, to take things all the way, go end to end. And I think that first hit me um, in the first few months when Satya was the CEO. He, was going to, he took over, I think, in February, and in May, he was going to give his first sort of public appearance as the Microsoft CEO in the Silicon Valley at the Recode conference. I, I think yeah, you said you were there. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he took a demo, he took one of our Microsoft research demos, which was this speech to speech uh, simultaneous translator uh, that we were putting into Skype. And uh, we were, of course, very proud and nervous and excited that he was demoing this. Um, the demo worked perfectly, which was a bit lucky because the technology was pretty nascent at the time. And then on stage, he said, and we will deliver the public beta by the end of the calendar year. And that was news to you. It's the first time I heard it. <laughs> and, um, and so it was this sort of um, realization. We were very excited in the first 30 seconds and then really terrified 
uh, after that. Um, and so that kind of, um, I liken that to the first time you ride a roller coaster. You really want to ride it, and then when you're going up that first hill, you realize you really don't want to ride it, and then by the time you finish that first ride, you, you want to ride it over and over again. And that's sort of what Satya Nadella has put us into. But isn't it a, a good thing, especially for AI products, if they're used widely by people, they, they get smarter. That's the best way to, to, to make them work better, rather than just wanting to keep it behind the scenes until it's perfect. Yeah, I, I think with the Skype translator effort, you know, we have a, a reach to, I don't know, 350 million daily active users. And so, so even just a tiny fraction of those people using the speech-to-speech -speech translation service has given us amazing ability in an unsupervised fashion to improve the speech recognition and the translation products. And that, that's been really transformational. And it's taught us lessons, too, because um, we were always approaching speech and translation using training sets from speeches and lectures, um, maybe optimizing them for, uh, for kind of short business transactions between strangers, like talking to a hotel clerk or a taxi driver. In Skype, no one talks like that. You know, you have two coworkers uh, talking to each other or a grandmother talking to a grandchild. Uh, all of the speech and language models we've found uh, are much more intimate, and we've had to redo them from scratch. And that just has just pushed us to a point where we think now we're on the verge of being able to do all sorts of, uh, let's say, enterprise uh, scenarios with our language processing. And things like Xiao Eyes that are just are able to interact and speak and converse in very socially relevant ways uh, has just uh, improved by leaps and bounds. But does it, you know, does it still go, go wrong from time to time? And, and if it does, do, does it break in a more surprising or less predictable way than traditional technologies? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've had a lot of embarrassing moments. Um, the, um, maybe the one that hit me was I was giving a keynote speech actually here in San Francisco about a year ago. And I used part of it to give a demo. So as I spoke in English, what was coming over the PA system was Mandarin. And you know, I was trying to pull at people's heartstrings. So I talked about growing up in a small and snowy town in upper Michigan. And then I noticed a couple of uh, Chinese speakers, apparently Chinese speakers in the audience, chuckling. Um, everyone else was sort of captivated. Afterwards, uh, when we were looking at the translation, snowy town in Upper Michigan was translated to snow white town in Upper Michigan. And I later learned that snow white town is slang in China for uh, a prostitute's town. Oh dear. So, <laughs> and it, it just wasn't caught in our, our profanity filters. Um, and so there is sort of a steady stream of these sorts of unpredictable things. One challenge that we've had to uh, face in the Skype translator is prosody. That's the rhythm and tone of language. So in Spanish, if you say something like, um, uh, uh, Jack, you have a daughter, no? She must be very beautiful. Um, the direct translation in most of the translators online, uh, including um, some of our competitors, will translate that in, in a very bad way. And, and so getting the... How bad? I mean, would I walk off the stage, you know, if I heard it, or...? Yeah, we might not, we might not talk again. Okay, so pretty bad. <laughs> and and so, so we've had to be able to uh, uh, develop new technology to capture prosody. Uh, there are just fluencies, all the ums and ahs and the, and the resets uh, that people do in conversational speech. Uh, and that's led to more philosophical questions because... Um, if you're trying to get a date in Shanghai, maybe those ums and ahs are actually part of your charm. Uh, and so it's really, and when they're all kind of cleaned out of your speech through the uh, Skype translator system, it's really raised a lot of questions about um, you know, what it is that we're communicating. And so does this mean, you know, Skype translator is one example, Show Ice is another. Are there other Microsoft initiatives where you're going to be more aggressive in, in rolling them out to people so you can learn from them, and, and what might those be? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've really 
also been very deeply, I think you'll hear this over and over again, I'm sure you did yesterday and, and you will today, uh, about just the amazing advances in machine learning, uh, in particular in uh, this sort of ever-widening uh, set of ideas that's emanating from the concept of deep neural nets and deep learning. Uh, and that's been absolutely true for us. Um, you know, in the computer vision area at the ImageNet competition in, in uh, December, uh, you know, we even surprised ourselves by learning for the first time just how much learning headroom there is. You know, we've gone now in our vision networks into hundreds of layers uh, using a concept called deep residual networks. And it's shocking to us that these systems still get better. You know, how, how can it matter if you have, you know, 185 layers versus 187? But it does matter. There are meaningful, measurable improvements. Um, and similarly, then the ability to really exploit more and more data is, is just remarkable. And there seems to be no end in sight. And so as we develop those things and deploy them internally, uh, of course, there are lots of applications to make, I don't know, uh, make our sales force smarter, uh, to improve Bing, uh, to, uh, you know, when you're, if you're using Windows 10 right now with the Surface Book and, you know, you wake up your machine, it recognizes your face very accurately. Uh, all of these things are just coming out, uh, silly things like um, the how old are you robot or the yes, Fetch it, app. It said I was 50, so. I d it didn't go down well with me, but uh -huh. no, we're getting there. Um, don't test it on your uh, spouse uh, with a, <laughs> uh, without testing privately on some photographs ahead of time. The, um, uh, these things are, um, are, are just reaching more and more people. And so one thing that we've been very committed to in MSR um, through a beta project called Project Oxford is to take all of these things that sort of get codified into golden nuggets and putting them on our cloud. Uh, for kind of, at this moment, for free access to developers. And, um, and uh, all of these silly apps that we've made, which have sort of been really viral, uh, the source code is open for those things, to give developers an idea of how you can uh, build uh, very intelligent uh, applications uh, using these sorts of things. That's great. Well, we're, we're going to be doing some questions. So if you, if you have questions, maybe assemble at either of the microphones and I'll rattle through a couple more here in the interim. One is, you know, you talk about doing neural networks, which are hundreds of layers deep for, for people who aren't very sad nerds who spend their time looking at this stuff. That means that it's computationally phenomenally expensive, you know, and if you, the more layers you add on, the more your computation of the resources needed to compute the thing scales. So are, are you just giving Satya Nadella a really big electricity bill every month? <laughs> like, how, how do you deal with that side of it, and how do you make that more efficient? Well, luckily, you know, in Microsoft, and I think this is probably true at the other cloud companies, the, internally we get free access to our own cloud, which is, I don't know what we would do otherwise. Um, but it's true. Um, so when you use deep learning to create a machine learned model, the models themselves are, can be very compact and efficient. So, so that's not the problem. But the training itself, uh, I guess deep learners, if you want to anthropomorphize it, deep learners are slow learners. Mm -hmm. So you need a lot of compute generally and a lot of data. Um, and so for us, this is a big deal, even with the global computational resources of the Microsoft Cloud, it, it, it can be challenging. And um, on top of that, the growth of customer workloads on our cloud is doubling uh, every year. In fact, it went up uh, by more than 100% in the last year. A lot of that doubling is being covered up by Moore's Law. Um, so right now, um, it sounds remarkable, but every month we're adding more uh, compute more processors to our cloud every month than we had in the entire Microsoft Cloud just three years ago. Which sounds like a lot, but if we actually hit the seven nanometer wall in 2018 or 2019 and we stop getting a Moore's Law scaling effect, uh, then these numbers really become unsustainable. And so we have actually in MSR been very active in developing technologies that uh, both in the near term that we can deploy as well as in the medium and long term to try to maintain um, a Moore's Law-like 
scaling in our cloud. So what's the near-term stuff? I mean, mostly people are just, instead of writing a really big check to Intel, they're writing a big check to Intel and a slightly smaller but still significant sum of some money to NVIDIA for GPUs. <laughs> You know, are you doing that or are you doing other things as well? So we're doing those things, but we're also trying to uh, do some more creative things. Um, uh, in the very near term, uh, one thing you can try to do is to eliminate the interpretive overhead of an instruction set architecture. Um, and you're, you're going to need to go slightly high level. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, when you have a CPU, like an x86 or an yeah. ARM processor, um, it actually executes a language. Mm -hmm. That's called the ISA, or Instruction Set Architecture. So you can think of a processor as a piece of hardware that uh, interprets that language. Uh, interpreting a language has overheads. So one thing you can try to do is to get rid of that interpretive overhead. And so we've been uh, working on using something called FPGAs, mm -hmm. Field Programmable Gate Arrays, um, doing some custom design with partners at Altera um, to see if we can have AI workloads compiled directly into highly optimized hardware circuits. And um, the first large scale experiment was to uh, implement the Bing ranking, web ranking engine uh, in that way. And uh, we reported uh, about a year ago the first results of that experiment and they were spectacularly good. Um, and so that has created a lot of interest and excitement in the here and now uh, to sort of create much uh, more capability in terms of lots of different workloads in our cloud using FPGAs. And also it helped Altera um, in its uh, getting acquired by Intel. So you're still writing Intel a really big check. Intel's please. Intel's a great partner. And um, I guess final question, what about what about quantum computers? Like, and like, how far away are we from that stuff being applied to anything that we, we'd see? So quantum computing is stupendously exciting right now. Um, at least in my part of MSR, it's the, the largest area of investment. And, um, and we've, we just have the sense that we're on the verge of major scientific achievements. Um, and those scientific achievements, then you know, there's just hope and optimism that those scientific achievements will lead to practical outcomes. It's hard to know when uh, and where. Uh, the way I've tried to explain it to Satya Nadella is our work in speech processing. Uh, we worked so hard for over a decade with no discernible practical improvement, and then suddenly we passed a tipping point, and, um, and the whole deep learning revolution sort of took off. Uh, I think a lot of scientific research has this flavor where you are kind of heads down for a long time. It's a long game, and then suddenly you pass some tipping point. With quantum, you know, we've made just gigantic advances in creating superconductor, semiconductor interfaces that allow uh, semiconducting materials uh, to operate as though they are superconducting. And what that means, just to boil it down, is the possibility of of um, semiconductors that uh, can operate e at extremely high clock rates and uh, with very, very little or no heat dissipation. And so it's just really spectacular. Fantastic. Well, Peter Lee, thank you very much for spending time with us. Yeah. Great to be here.